From our April hearings, we may learn to put our trust in thee, and brutal fact persuade us to adventure our in peace. And we have three papers that speak of the persuasiveness uh, that Ralph and Bush encountered and that he engendered in peace. Our first paper is going to be Everybody is God's Somebody, Samuel DeWitt Proctor in the Black Social Gospel. Uh, by Adam Bond, who is Associate Professor of Church History at the Proctor School of Theology of Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia, a PhD from uh, Marquette University, and he is also the pastor of Providence Baptist Church in Ashland, Virginia. Following him will be uh, Dr. Christina um, Littlefield, and his PhD is from Cambridge, Trinity Hall, and there is a small uh, error in her bio. She has been elevated to associate uh, professor, so she now has a higher rank than she did when she sent her bio in. Uh, sowing seeds, how Walter Rausch and Bush's failed newspaper to the right germinated his later muckraking work. Uh, Rausch and Bush told a Sunday school class in Rochester in 1913 that his ideas really began to develop as he began writing for the papers. And I think that had to be a, a major part of it. And so we will hear uh, about that side of Ralph and Bush's thought process. And then uh, Dr. Chakravarti Zara from uh, the Metro Chicago area in ABC Life. He holds a PhD from the Lutheran Theological School in Chicago um, and has uh, worked in missiology, uh, works with the Baptist Peace Fellowship of North America, and will be uh, speaking on the social gospel of the Orient the story of the Telugu Church. And they will present their papers back to back to back without break. Then we will have a, con a time for question and answering. And so as uh, Jeremy runs the mic around, indicate who you're asking, because all three will field questions at the end. So when you ask a question, uh, indicate who you're directing the question to. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Adam Bond. Thank you so much, Philip, and I want to uh, thank as well our team of conveners. I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this event, and I am uh, so glad that someone thought enough of the uh, proposal that I sent in to find its way into this space to be a part of this conversation. Uh, so I, I am grateful. My pastor in Milwaukee used to say that I'm both glad and happy. I'm glappy uh, to be here. <laughs> so uh, let me do this. I know Jeremy has started to time. Uh, I want to invite Dr. Proctor into the room, so to speak. Uh, I tell my students in uh, my church history classes that I talk to the dead. Uh, and they talk back. Uh, and so I want to invite Dr. Proctor into the room by way of, of a brief, uh, just a brief sound clip uh, from one of his sermons called uh, Holy Ground. And in this clip, uh, it provides us with a brief opportunity to get a sense of the ripples uh, that were caused by the waves that Walter Rauschenbusch uh, uh, led loose. Now, I also want to tell uh, Dr. Gushy uh, that I'm going to sin boldly. Uh, I think that's the only time I'm going to mention Dr. Rauschenbusch uh, in this presentation. Uh, so, uh, at the, at the Rauschenbusch conference, well, that's two mentions. So. <laughs> so, with that in mind, let me invite Dr. Proctor into the room. Some of us went to theological seminaries in the early generation and found ourselves out of touch with some of the conversations that were going on. For example, I thought that all of the theology that I had learned, the liberation of theology, after all, I was a son of all drugs and witch and all of the other great social <coughs> disciples, and it seemed to me a little bit redundant.
Latin America, and in the scattered communities of Asia and Africa. It is a theology that puts God on the side of the press, and maybe that's why we have to call it by a new name. It's a kind of a correcting, a kind of a reminder to us that our own theology had become too accommodated to middle class considerations. It is a theology that takes sides in political contest. It gets its hands dirty. It gets right down to the voting booth. It gets down to the labor union's picket line, into boycott strategies and sit-ins and lie-ins and sleep-ins and weigh-ins and all such tactics. It is not a neutral, passive, competitive approach, but an activist, decisive, bold involved. Therefore, to many, it looks new. To others, it looks like what we ought to been about all the time. It looks a lot like Amos coming out of Tekoa, crying that justice flow down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Like Jeremiah in Patrick's jail. Like Mordecai at the palace gate. Or Daniel praying toward Jerusalem. Or John the Baptist turning down the sons of Abraham who came to be baptized. Or Paul before Felix and Festus and Agrippa. It sounds like John Huss failing to repent and, and going to the burning states and Roger Williams breaking the wind of winds of Salem to go into Providence to establish a church that was free from the government. It sounds like those Presbyterians from Pittsburgh coming down to Norfolk, Virginia fight off the hostile crowds and to build the Norfolk Mission College where my mother and father were given the secondary and teacher education a long time ago. It was an active kind of a theology. To me, the Horatian theology, therefore, is not a difference in kind, but a difference in the degree of commitment. Some of us are having trouble using these new labels, liberation and non-liberation. What kind of theology we ask could there be that is not liberation theology? Is there any kind of Christian theology that would put God on the side of the Pharaohs and the Ahabs and the Herods of the world? Is it not really the case of talking about sound and integrated theology on the one hand and weak and incoherent, abbreviated and unrelated theology on the other? On the one hand, we have theology in action applied and lived and gotten up, shaved up and out of the bed, dressed and in the street, where the action is. On the other hand, we have theology still in the street, still in the library stack, still in the books, in the mind, but uncommitted to doing anything about anything. <laughs> That's pretty good for you. Senator DeWitt Crocker faced in trying to be a bridge figure uh, between the different theological streams that he uh, believed he witnessed in American Christianity. Now, let me give you a little background about Dr. Crocker before I proceed with the main argument, so to speak. Senator DeWitt Crocker was born on July 13, 1921. He was a prominent Baptist minister, college president of two historically black universities, a former associate director of the Peace Corps during the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, and a pastor of the historic Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, succeeding Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. Proctor's genius was his ability to translate what I, in person such as Dwight Hopkins, called black public faith. Now let me take a moment to distinguish between black public faith and the, so and the black social gospel. I define black public faith as the vocation that guided and still guides black religious intellectuals and practitioners in discourse about the systemic issues of a racialized nation state. African American religious intellectuals, practitioners, and theologians engage and or engage larger publics in an attempt to raise awareness of and combat primarily white supremacist supremacist ideologies and policies that govern national and global political constructs. This is a vocation, a call, 
It requires a commitment to conversations that do not necessarily take place in congregational settings or conversations that find their way into the faith formation literature of church life. A second term that I want to define is the black social gospel. Now, many of you who have read Gary Dorian's wonderful book, uh, Breaking White Supremacy, would find in chapter two, I believe, in the very first paragraph, a great definition of the black social gospel. But let me give you mine. <laughs> The black social gospel is a social Christianity and or philosophical and political tradition that emerged in the late 19th century. It found its voice in the early years of the 20th century and began to wane in the latter years of the civil rights movement. Now, that's a formal way to put it, to talk about its formal identification, but really, the black social gospel was at the inception of black Christianity in this country. The black social gospel identified race as a point of departure for discerning a religious solution for the political and economic ills of society. Persons such as Ralph Luker, among other thinkers, have documented the ways in which the black social gospel has operated as an ideological force, a social political philosophy, behind the creation of organizations and clubs such as the NAACP and Urban League, among others. But studies, recent studies by persons such as Peter Parrish, Gary Dorian, uh, Susan Lindley, uh, Barbara Diane Savage, and Christopher Evans have helped us distinguish the <coughs> theological merits of, of, black, of black social gospel traditions within the larger canon of black religious thought. Samuel DeWitt Proctor, Howard Thurman, Nanny Helen Burroughs, and others committed to a reading of the Christian faith that made a theological case for the gospel as something that was and is socially oriented. They were guided by what Peter Paris calls the non-racist black prophetic principle, that is, a belief in the personhood of the parenthood of God and the kinship of all humanity. And they envisioned a beloved or a genuine community that celebrated the inherent personhood of every human being on the face of the earth. In most instances, black social gospelers privileged a historical Jesus who was or became Christ through his paradigm-shattering life as a human being. And they saw the church as one vehicle for transforming society. Walter Rauschenbusch gave some of these religious leaders language for what they already believed, notions that were already embedded in, in their congregational and cultural DNA. Proctor's public faith had, at its foundation, a concern for black humanity. His numerous sermons and publications reflect or reflected a belief in the worth of persons, especially but not limited to African Americans. Race remained a constant in his religious reflections. His own experience as an African American included the life and death of Jim Crow, the Civil Rights Movement, and the introduction of affirmative action. The relationship between race and religion in the United States, moreover, is obvious. As Dwight Hopkins notes, one cannot speak of theological anthropology, our understanding of humanity in light of God in America without race entering into the conversation. In his public presentations, Proctor argued for the equality of African American existence, African American humanity. He grounded his beliefs about humanity in the claim of God's parenthood and humanity's kinship. He preached this message, everybody is God's somebody. That was an actual sermon that he used from Acts where the text states that out of one blood, God has created all nations. This idea represents Proctor's complex response to racism and its consequences in American public life. As Proctor saw it, a spurious anthropology plagued the United States. He fought the racist practices that stemmed from that anthropology with a public faith with a black social gospel that reflected 
uh, that was reflected in sermons and in classroom, in his classroom lectures. From the pulpit to the classroom, Proctor hailed this idea that everybody is God's somebody. All human beings are the children of God. This basic tenet of Christianity was foundational in the liberal theology of his age, but some believed it more than others. Proctor was an integrationist, and I struggle with these labels, uh, integrationist, and later I might say accommodationist. I'm starting to, uh, I'm beginning to think of Proctor as a bourgeois nationalist. And I got this language from, from my uh, dean at the School of Theology, Corey D. Walker. I'll say more about that in a moment. Proctor was an advocate, an activist, who fought against racism with the power of persuasion. He was trying to educate for the humanization of society. He believed that racism was at the root of many of the problems that adversely affected African Americans. He wanted to increase the opportunities that would create greater prospects for children of all races to achieve educational success and for persons who were in poverty to achieve a reasonable standard of living. He wanted to eradicate racism. He argues that, it, that racism is an antecedent to many of the problems in society. His claim for equality was a call for a moral regeneration among persons who oppose racial uplift for African Americans. His fight for equality also displayed advocacy, uh, the advocacy of a black middle class ethic of self-help by way of thrift, piety, education, and political participation. This notion that he was both black and middle class, American and Christian, so to speak, all wrapped up in one, is indicative of a long-standing uh, tradition within African American Christianity, as well that has concerned itself with social ethics and the problem of racism in American life. So let me give you two points. Basically, what I'm arguing is this, that Proctor leveraged the pulpit and the classroom to educate for the humanization of society. And by that, basically, he was trying to make plain that idea that everybody is God's somebody. To be sure, Proctor was well aware of the problems of race in American society. The focus of several of his sermons and talks uh, was racism and its concomitant issues. He saw racism's connection to poverty, crime, and many other social concerns. For him, the problem was an American one. He did not see racism as merely a black concern or white concern. All Americans should understand the consequences of racism in American life. In a 1985 sermon entitled, Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, Proctor proclaimed, we are still fighting the Civil War in so many places. We've not yet settled down and decided that blacks are free, that they are human, that they don't bite, that they don't go around all the time thinking of something violent to do. They do learn when they are taught. They can think. They can be responsible. Every day we are being nagged over and over again by this issue rising up to haunt us. It is practically impossible for us to spend the day thinking about things that everyone else would want to think about without having to pause at some time during the day and reckon with this strife that follows us on the basis of race in this country. We need to see this whole issue reconciled and the nation become one in freedom, and one in purpose, and one in fairness, one in justice, one in opportunity, one in well-being of all her people. That sounds like a Baptist preacher, doesn't it? <laughs> His early life in segregated Norfolk, Virginia, observing the racial codes of the South, displayed clearly for Proctor the problems of American society. It is fair to say that he saw racism as the primary concern of the moral crisis in the United States. At the root, racism was the devaluation of black personhood. The racial problem in the United States concerned Proctor much more after his missionary tours in Europe and Asia. 
1954, Proctor reported his impressions of the world after returning from his missionary tour of 1953. He was a Baptist envoy, along with several other American Baptists who worked with local leaders in places such as India to turn over control of Baptist schools to the indigenous groups in those countries. During the trip, he reported that several residents questioned him about the nature of his relationship as a black person with the colonizers of the world. He was pressed to consider who he was as an American and as a citizen of the world. In one account, he recalled, the bottom line was that I saw how many dark-skinned people lived in the world and that they all had been colonized by Europeans. This gave me an authentic identity with third world people and their struggles for clean water, nutrition, food, health care, safe housing, basic education, and hope for a brighter future." End quote. The report that Proctor submitted to the National Baptist Voice, one of the denominational newspapers of the, American, the National Baptist Convention USA, represents one of the earliest written statements that we have in which Proctor presents his, presented his thoughts of matters of race. Prompted by J. Pius Barber, the editor of The Voice at that time, to recall his travels, Proctor shared stories about the way in which white missionaries raised questions in the native populations about the ability of African Americans to proselytize persons in foreign countries. The sentiment affected the mood of the native residents, prompting them to look askance at Proctor until they conversed with him. Proctor discerned the legacy of colonialism during that trip and realized the far-fetching influence of white supremacy. He saw, moreover, the extent to which Europeans, especially white Christians, were viewed with distrust in several locales. He stated, one night I had it out with leftist students in Yamshapur, India. They scolded me for being an American and a black person. They thought I should have fled my country or shot myself. But Proctor's response says much about his faith in America. He wrote, I explained that despite the injustices, I had accepted America as the place most likely to mature into a free, pluralistic society with individual liberties, a government by the consent of the governed, and an economy that could provide equal employment opportunities, housing, and education. The trip alerted him to the problem, to the urgency of the problems in the United States. He described the results of his travels by stating that his conscience underwent a real metamorphosis. He would bring that into later conversations by talking about the ways in which this whole thing was messed up going back to 1619. He argued that it arrived with the first enslaved, the, the problems of American society arrived with the first enslaved Africans at Jamestown, Virginia. When whites realized that Africans could hold up under North American weather and diet, he said, they made racial slavery an institution. He continued, so today's black minority condition is traceable to this incipient condition. Proctor saw in racial slavery the foundation of prejudice in American society. He preached it and he educated folks, telling them that a part of the crisis and self-concept among African Americans was dated back to the ways in which there was not much time to really develop healthy self-egos when one who was an African American interacted with the larger culture. For the larger culture always sent messages to African Americans, to black people, saying that you were not worth much in this society. Proctor, however, understood from his own background, his own upbringing, that basically that was not the truth. For in his community, being insulated somewhat, he called it really a community of wholeness and uh, well-being in which, and let, let me just say this real quick, Proctor had a problem really with, um, with black theology and black power. 
Uh, one of the reasons that you heard what he said in the audio clip was because I believe Proctor didn't have to worry about being uh, brought up with a, a healthy self-confidence because his community in Huntersville, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, allowed him to always enforce that he was God's somebody. His grandmother told him that. His mother, his church, the Main Street Baptist Church told him that. So Proctor understood that when James Cone and, up, James Cone and others came up with black theology and womanist theology as well, that they were really trying to provide a corrective because they were some of the first persons going into a quote-unquote desegregated uh, environment. So that was my first point. He's educating, he's leveraging the classroom, he's leveraging these sermons, the pulpit, to basically help to humanize society, make it plain that uh, we are all God's children, that everybody is God's somebody. But the second thing, um, the second point that I would make about Proctor's, um, Proctor's life and his work is that basically he was a bridge figure uh, between traditions and cultures, religious traditions, theological traditions and cultures. Proctor could look to the left and look to the right, so to speak, in the theological spectrum and basically understand that uh, they all had a purpose. They all had a purpose and that they all came to the conclusion in some way or another that very idea that everybody has got somebody. Proctor wanted African Americans to move beyond living into stereotypes and embrace the self-understanding of blackness that would allow them to move freely among whites. In this way, Proctor might not might have been not only an integrationist, but what I would call a bourgeois nationalist, because he was able to move into certain circles and bring African Americans and other persons of color into those spaces with him. He started a program at Rutgers University. He was called to the University of Wisconsin, where he tried to create a community for African American students. He would later go on to start a doctor of ministry program at United Theological Seminary, and if I were to, to really uh, sit down again with Gary Dorian at some point, I hope we get an opportunity, one of the things that I would talk about in terms of how we can continue the scholarship of, of the black social gospel is that it did not stop with King. While many people kind of bring the black social gospel to 1968 and ended really with King, Proctor lives on to 1997. And he is forming and helping to inform all of these people, these black preachers who see him as a giant. So Jeremiah Wright was in that first doctor of ministry class at United Theological Seminary. Susan Johnson Cook, who became an ambassador in the uh, Obama administration, was also in that first class. There were lots of, of, of other ministers who are in celebrated and uh, highly respectable historic churches in this country. And Proctor helped promote the black social gospel by leveraging these spaces and being a bridge between what was, what is, and what is to come, so to speak. So about that. Proctor spent the majority of his life arguing for an integrated, prejudice-free society that affirms persons of all races. Although he saw a great deal of progress on the matter, he was able to see the issues that remained at hand Proctor lived long enough to witness several changes, but it is obvious from his sermon illustrations and writings that he was still combating racism during the twilight of his life. He fought for racial progress that was real, validated by moral and legislative support that he had seen happen over time, and he celebrated legal victories, hoping that there was still more to come because he preached and believed that everybody is God's somebody. Thank you for your time.